Brady is an artist and illustrator, born and raised and working in Honolulu, Hawaii. He received a BFA specializing in drawing from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2012. In 2013 and 2014, Brady curated the exhibition Crossing Cultures, the Art of Manga in Hawaii, which explored the influence Hawaii has had upon the work of 12 local manga artists and writers. He currently works as collections manager for the Honolulu Museum of Art, uh, which he says offers a wonderful opportunity to handle and experience a variety of art from all over the world on a daily basis. Please welcome Brady Evans. Maybe she'll go after Janie, she's taller. <laughs> okay, I just want to plug a really quick um, thing real quick. At, um, on October 20th, which is a Thursday, at the Honolulu Museum of Arts School, I'm going to be doing a comics workshop from 6 to 8 p.m. And it's through the Honolulu Printmakers Nexus uh, Book Arts Fair programming that they're having. So you can register online at honoluluprintmakers.org, and it's ten dollars, and it covers the cost of materials and everything. And hopefully, it'll be a lot of fun. So um, just to kind of reiterate what Bluma and Jason talked about in regards to the community and Kauai Khan, and and I, I pretty much grew up going to the Kauai Khan. I was fifteen when. It first started, and I've gone every year since then. I think it's been 12 years, I think. 12 conventions. <laughs> and I was about 15 or 16 when I first met Audra and Scott and, and Jason. And I think I met Mama a little later, but I can honestly say that it's um, been a big part, a big chunk of my life, and probably more than half of my life I've spent in, in that community. And it's, it's been fun being a part of it and, and Realizing that hey, it's lasting longer than I thought it would, <laughs> and I'm happy to be happy to work to ride the wave and, and um, also produce this this exhibition called Crossing Cultures: The Art of Manga in Hawaii that I put together. I worked on it from 2012 to 2013. The show opened in 2013 at Windward Community College Gallery Ilani, and it traveled to the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii in 2014. And um, my background is in studio art. I got my BFA from the UH Manoa, but I also worked a lot in the gallery there, and I transitioned a bit into museum studies. And so this project was really a combination of the two of my passions of comics and manga and local culture and museum studies and exhibition design and management. So um, this project was like about a year and a half long worth of research. It, com it was a lot of um, interviewing people in the community, artists. I, I selected about, there were seven, like seven, or, uh, seven different projects, uh, different comics that I chose for the exhibition. And some of them had an artist and a writer, some of them were just an artist. And so it came out to about 12 different people that I worked with. And I also worked with but like Jason and Guma, and interviewed them about the community and featured their stories as well. And the aim of the exhibition really was to examine manga in Hawaii and what made the work here that, I guess for, for simplistic sort of way we would call it manga, what made it unique in Hawaii. I also was a little careful in calling the artist, uh, it, manga artist? because I feel that not all the artists would identify as manga artists. So instead, the artists are all heavily influenced by manga in some way or another. Their works may not immediately, the manga might not immediately come to mind when you look at their work, but deep down or maybe on the surface or in, any, in a large chunk of it, there's an there's a influence from manga. So I looked at how People were were reinterpret things like reinterpreting Japanese culture, reinterpreting um, local culture, 
local history, even Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian history, and even recent developments in manga um, in, in Japan, and how it kind of all gets kind of mixed together in Hawaii. And, and a lot of times we call Hawaii this melting pot of different cultures. And I went into it with the assumption that manga is the same way, and I researched it and, and tried to dissect it in the same way as well. And so this, this one panel features the work of Audra and Purichi and Scott Rishinaga, Nemu Nemu, who um, just talked earlier. So I kind of went backwards in time when it came to the history of, of, of manga in Hawaii. And in Japan, it's much, manga came before anime and TV shows. A lot of the TV shows were influenced by comics. But in Hawaii, we kind of got things a little backwards. We instead got the TV shows first as Boma um, talked about earlier. We, seeing the TV shows like got people interested in that culture, and then later, in the 2000s, the manga came along. So um, a lot of people who grew up and were born uh, around this time, in, like born in the late 60s, early 70s, probably in Hawaii, probably knew about or watched um, the TV show called Kaida, uh, which is a, based off of, a, a, or it was created by a manga artist. It's about a, mechanical superhero. It, it's a live action series, so it's very... Um, today we might look at it and think of it as kind of corny in terms of the special effects, but at the time the special effects were very, um, you know, very, very unique for the time, and I think people in Hawaii didn't, and the kids growing up didn't automatically think that it was, that it was Japanese, or that, but that it was different, and that there was something really engaging about it. And so this image I love, it's um, where in Kikaida appeared, Kikaida, I think it's uh, Kikaida Zero One, and I didn't watch it, I didn't grow up watching the series, so. Um, but they, when they made these public appearances, like at Arakawa's, which um, no longer exists, or like at Pro Ridge Mall, there were like so many, so many kids, and, and now I, my friends uh, and some people that I worked with who were little kids at the time um, said that, oh, they were there with the thousands of other sweaty kids and sweaty parents, and waiting for hours just to see um, appearance of these um, costume actors to come out and it just was a was a was an amazing phenomenon and, and speaking with Joanne Nomia who was responsible for bringing over um, these this TV series to Hawaii she said that she never expected it to be this big and to continue to be very popular with new generations but also the same people who grew up with it and who are now in their mid forties I believe. No, I don't want to date anyone <laughs> particular. So we have um, live action TV series, and um, in the 80s and 90s, what Luma talked about as well, we have development of comic book stores across the US and in, in Hawaii as well. And here are two examples that are still in existence, um, Gecko Books and Comics and Collector Maniacs, although there's not as many nearly as there used to be, probably at the height in the 80s and 90s. But it was during this time and during these areas that we see the beginnings of anime clubs, like um, like Josh, things that met, uh, that, that Buma and, and talked about, and that Amitra was a part of, that would that were kind of like little pockets of pockets of culture and pockets of um, pockets of fandom that weren't connected at the time as nearly as much as they are today, but. Um, people who were coming together and discussing things and, and realizing that this was manga and anime were, were anime at the time were very different than their American counterparts. So I'm going to talk a bit about some artists locally who were that I featured in the exhibition that were that showed influence, that were strongly influenced by various manga, anime things that um, or that work in work that all work in Hawaii. And so John Markami is um, you might recognize his work from local kind of reading cards to see it longs, or he has a comic in the Star Advertiser in the Sunday newspaper every other Sunday. And John is very influenced by Kaida and the, those Tokusatsu live action TV shows that he grew up with. And so this character he created a Gordon Ryder is a parody of those TV series. So instead of a very heroic character, he's for one, he's based on a real person, and um, his costume is made up of things that you might find in an office or just on the fly, like uh, construction 
construction reflector vest and toilet paper for a scarf and two little drinking straws for antenna. And this basically means you can fly anywhere. But um, and he's not the most skilled of a, of a hero, but I think his, he has a good heart and he has. He, that's kind of what makes him the, the protagonist and makes him kind of like a local superhero. But John works a lot of, also works a lot of local culture into it, localism. And, um, not as much pigeon, but um, I think more local gags and humor into the works that are very popular with people that grew up here, people that grew up in Hawaii during the 70s at that time. Some more stills from Gordon Ryder. Actually, been going on for about ten years as well. I think a little more than ten years that John's been working on it. On and off, he, he has other spin-off series too. This isn't kind of his main gig. I'm gonna um, go into work Roy Chang's work next. Roy Chang um, did uh, a book called Casing Kiara and the Curse of the Kiki, and Roy is of Native Hawaiian descent, and he interested in mythology of Hawaii. And so he produced this book a few years ago, I believe 2011. And the book is not, a, it's not quite a comic book. It's a graphic, it's a graphic novel in the sense that it's a, a light novel with interspersed with about 100 different manga illustrations. So Roy is very influenced from Hayao Miyazaki and Spirited Away, movies like Spirited Away. and. So what Hayao Miyazaki did was he took a lot of Japanese traditional culture with Spirited Away and redid them in a contemporary way and kind of made them new again for younger audiences. So Roy wanted to do something similar where he took Native Hawaiian stories and put them into a contemporary setting and showed it into a, in, a, in, a, in a manga page setting, which I think is interesting. He also adapts a lot of cinematic um, tropes in his manga, like you notice there's no text in these, the text is all, um, the text is, is on the next, it's on the page over in, in a, a prose style, so it allows him to show the movement of the camera, like in the top left corner, they are flying birds, and then centering in on the two girls as they landed over there. And I think it shows, um, it, it's, it makes the page a lot more dramatic, and it really shows off how manga can be very visual storytelling be a very powerful and it's visual storytelling. Journey of Heroes is produced by Stacey Hayashi and illustrated by Damon Wong, who is an animator. And Journey of Heroes tells the story of the 100th um, Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. And there's been a lot of um, different stories and things written about these two groups who are made up primarily of Japanese Americans, a lot from Hawaii and some from the mainland that fought during World War II were the most, the most decorated, um, <clears throat> the most decorated um, militarily um, groups of that time, even though they faced a lot of discrimination for being Japanese American. And um, what I think was interesting about Stacy's work is that she utilized, or her illustrator utilized, a form that's very um, familiar in manga called the chibi, or chibi means small, or the diminutive in Japanese. And it's a style that's like a, kind of like used in comic relief usually, like a large head, small body. And what I found interesting was that she decided to use this style, which is normally used um, in kind of a comical way, to get younger audiences interested in this story. And the story is actually quite, um, I mean, it's about war. And there's some very funny moments and very lighthearted moments, but there's actually some very dramatic moments as seen in the page um, farthest to the right there. and. Um, I feel that her work is, it's, it's at the same time very respectful of the veterans and very, who, are, who are still alive and who worked with her on this project. But it, it kind of, it's a good introduction, I think, to the story to people and younger kids who may not be as, may not be as um, well aware of the achievements of this group and, and, and their, their elders. Stacey is also very active in making a, her long-term goal is to make a movie out of this, uh, out of this, out of this story, and she's, I believe, working on it right now and um, in reproduction. So hopefully, we'll see it soon in theaters. Another story that goes with local history is Hamakua Hero by Patsy Iwasaki and Avery Burrito, who are our big island representatives for the exhibition. And this story is about Katsugoto, who was lynched in, who was Japanese, 
moved to Hawaii, was in a plantation worker, but he was able to buy his, his freedom, basically started his own business, became a target for a lot of the other the Caucasian businesses, businessmen in the area, and he was got his up put on him, and he was lynched in 1889, I believe. And so, in a similar way that um, Stacy works with Journey of Heroes, Patsy decided to, would, wanted to make a uh, comic that was based on this, based on this, this man's life, and in order to, to, to bring it to today and to show it to younger generations. And she told me that she chose, she thought of doing it in a manga format because manga is often used for very dramatic stories and, and difficult, like somewhat, it can be used for more difficult, difficult storytelling, difficult stories. I mean, it, this story basically tells, I mean, it's a very lively story, a very nice story as well, but it ends with his, his death, and, which was not a very, which was a very violent death. But it, it does it in a very tasteful way. And again, it's a good primer for someone who's more interested in learning about local history and this story. And finally, I'd like to end with the work of um, the younger, one of the younger artists in the exhibition, Tara Tamayori, who is um, born in 1989, so she came of age in the early 2000s, and which is around the time when manga was being widely produced and translated in the U.S. And you get um, and Audrey and Jason touched on with major, major um, amounts of it coming in, and so Tara is probably the one one of the artists in the exhibition is very closely really closely up to date with current trends in manga and her work I feel has the most contemporary manga feel to it. So she I feel kind of represents the more current time, a more current um, current trend that, that I see a lot of artists who are, who are actively looking at things online, looking at what people are doing in Japan and around the world, and I feel that manga is becoming much more globalized in terms of style and then Audra kind of touched on as well with artists like Ken Nimura who's, who's international and whose style and work can't really be pinned down to being merely Japanese or merely European or so and I think that's kind of what's really interesting and what, what piques my interest now in manga is that mix and that international mix sort of like the theme of the exhibition, Crossing Cultures, but instead of Hawaii um, cultures and ideas mixing, we have it happening around the world and happening very quickly, too. So, and um, the exhibition is free to view online at hawaiianmanga.com. So if anyone's interested, the images from the show are online, as well as all the text, and there's a lot of free digital downloads, including a manga that we wrote and produced that tells the history of manga in Japan that you can download and, and print out and use for educational purposes. So hopefully you'll be able to check that out when you have the time. So that's it for me. Thank you.